Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. Assassins, right? It's where you be. Once again. But I got some help for you. Check this out. Here's the escalator. World dominator. Miseducator. Boom, toon, walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in eugenetic disruption. Won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just wanna sit around and theorize. Meanwhile, in the street, another pair of police state hate related victims. The mind's eyes lay lifeless Looking at concrete Many topics, many ways to drop it Jim Crow say Let's see versus Ferguson separate but equal court case. So this is a very important clause known as the Jim Crow laws that would be used to separate black people from white people in regard to basic interaction, basic sharing of public services, basic sharing of any form of interaction or fraternization really. You can have a picture that uh, shows literally signs or it says colored waiting room. So non-white people would, even for something as basic as literally doing nothing, which is to wait, you would have to be physically separated as to avoid fraternization under these Jim Crow laws after the Plessy versus Ferguson court case. The Red Summer of 1919 is a very important moment as it would relate to matters of civil service, really. So in this time period, you have a lot of veterans returning from World War I, where the United States fought on the side of the Triple Entente. And in that regard, you had lots of Black people serving in the American military in this time. Now, the military was still heavily segregated, as was mentioned in the previous section, However, in this sense, you had black soldiers that were putting their lives on the line and fighting in combat against the enemies of the United States of America that are returning to be brutalized and abused by the very same country that they had just devoted their lives to protecting. And so you have lots of examples of black World War I veterans, you know, uh, forming militias to protect black communities from racist mobs that would go after uh, black populations during this time frame. So you have lots of examples of uh, black uh, communities and black neighborhoods that were formed and were not only self-sufficient, but prospering based on just levels of uh, internal economic interaction and investments of the black people living there. And these places were truly brutalized in horrid acts of terrorism by white people that were uh, just uh, aghast at such displays. And these are situations where you just have law enforcement turning a complete blind eye, or even in some cases assisting in the brutalization and the destruction of uh, black prosperity or even black existence in many cases. So to dive a bit into the aspects of uh, American policing, it's a very complex history. 
certainly something that you can draw from in regards to all of the uh, farthest roots of American policing, which is the same with all policing in the world, is that policing is a form of uh, law enforcement and armed law enforcement for the sake of protecting power structures. And when you're dealing with a system that has inherently racist or bigoted aspects that are accepted or in many cases directly key and integral to said power structures, that is often where you can find said roots. So a common connection and link to policing and uh, uh, in, the, in the United States of America, and especially in the Deep South, or uh, direct links to uh, slave patrols, which were you know, uh, informal groups of law enforcement that were used to return escaped slaves to their uh, plantations should they uh, ever flee from their locations. Other such examples to uh, protecting the uh, pre-existing power structures, one that was common in the uh, Puritan Northeast were you know, local uh, you know, night patrols that would be responsible for uh, monitoring and policing the uh, religious uh, dignity of their neighbors should they step out of line of the uh, the Puritan roots and traditions, you know, branching into things such as uh, suspicions of blasphemy or, pap or uh, papery, as it would have been said at the time, or even branching to things such as witchcraft, which is something that's very commonly known to be associated with the history of the Northeast and uh, the United States. So you can see that there's lots of roots that tie into these things, always about preserving it's very strong and in many cases historically corrupt power systems, including in many cases direct links to upholding slavery. You have lots of history of brutalization of black people in the United States. And this is something that is perpetrated on many levels, both institutionally in regards to uh, codified law. And now in this time period, we're often branching into how uh, a specific level of physical cruelty and brutality is inflicted upon the black citizenry by the white citizenry. You have examples of entire neighborhoods, let alone individual homes being burned and looted because they were examples of black prosperity. You have situations of raw and bloodied beatings against black individuals by white mobs for uh, simple matters of fraternization or stepping outside of the uh, perceived bounds of what was acceptable at the time. And these are things that continue in certain levels. You have uh, perceptions and stereotypes born from these sorts of things, such as the perceptions of black men as inherent threats especially inherent threats to the vulnerable uh, white woman, which had to be protected by the white male citizenry at all costs. And that was a very common uh, inciting incident for a lot of these acts of brutality. Lynching, of course, being the ultimate example and symbol of this, where you would have uh, this particular symbology. You know, you would take a, uh, a black individual and you would hang them by the neck until dead. And that's the bare minimum of what the uh, technical definition of lynching is. It was often also associated with horrid and cruel acts of mutilation and uh, embarrassment. You, mas uh, you know, it, it even often emasculating the, uh, the uh, subjects in question in a very literal sense, not in the uh, sociological sense. And these are truly horrid and bloody evil acts that were committed as quite literal uh, acts of terrorism in order to cause enough fear and panic in order to lower and keep the, uh, the uh, Black Americans in their place that were deemed for them to uh, subsist in. To move back into aspects of codified discrimination, governmental discrimination, the Social Security Act. 
So you have lots of examples of government acts and actions that were taken to assist and aid in American families that were uh, suffering economically. And all of these laws are needed. All of these laws were helpful to aid in you know, uh, American families that uh, needed a bit of assistance from their government, you know, taxes paid back into assisting and uh, for social welfare and things. But the concern and the issue here, of course, is in how, like in many situations like this, Black Americans were explicitly excluded from this kind of aid, whereas a white family receiving social aid, which they should, like all people, it was seen as helping as a, a neighbor or a friend who is down on their luck, like everyone is. When Black people were seen as receiving acts such as this, it was seen as a cancer or a leech that was feeding off of the pulse of white America that didn't deserve to be aided, that weren't your neighbor, that weren't your friend, that weren't your fellow citizen, but an enemy that was taking from you, that was taking what you deserved. And that was a main way of how this was demonized. And it's a main way of how this continues to be demonized. It's a main way of how this continues to be looked at to the modern day when you talk about social welfare programs. And regardless of if Black people are the primary recipients of them, which they are not, they are the ones that are stigmatized. We are the ones that are stereotyped as being reliant on these things, despite the math not even supporting it. So to continue with the aspects of uh, segregation in the military, as was described previously about uh, America's segregated continued going into World War II. So you have uh, lots of examples of you know, continued standards of having uh, entirely different regiments and roles that Black people weren't able to participate in and things such as that, and that goes into World War II. And I had mentioned a few sections ago in regards to the Civil War about true causes of a war. They are often distilled both in propaganda and on an individual basis in the war, such as soldiers, to being about moral reasons. And I don't believe there is a war in American history that better exemplifies this than World War II, because the enemy of the United States of America during World War II, or enemies, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and also fascist Italy, are all nations that committed horrendous war crimes against various people. In the cases of Nazi Germany against uh, countless minorities throughout uh, its territory, and most famously and uh, most emphasized the, uh, the Ashkenazi and other European Jewish populations that were residing in Germany were horrifically uh, massacred. In the cases of Imperial Japan, you know, all across uh, Southeast Asia and across China, there are lots of war crimes and horrific brutalities uh, committed against them. In the cases of Fascist Italy, there are also war crimes committed throughout uh, you know, the Arab world, in North Africa and East Africa. And so because of these atrocities that were committed by these groups, it's very commonly held that this war, World War II, and America's interaction and role with in it was done for re combat these, uh, these atrocities, combat these war crimes. And that's very much not the case when you actually observe the facts of it, because these acts and war crimes were committed long before the United States got involved with it. So if that's what it was about. It would have happened then. It was about protecting political allies, such as the United Kingdom being on its last legs and its war against Nazi Germany. It was even more so about a direct attack from the Empire of Japan against the uh, United States. And those actions in regards to protecting its naval interests, in regards to protecting its oil interests and stopping the Empire of Japan from advancing its oil interests that dragged the United States into the war. And so all of this to show that often this is held in the minds of especially American people about how vital and moral this conflict was 
And for some individuals, that may have been true, but especially in regards to how Black soldiers volunteered to fight in these conflicts and how Black soldiers were often there when various camps mistreating these uh, brutalized individuals were liberated only to return to their country where they were continued to be brutalized against by their own fellow citizenry. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.